Welcome to Journey, everybody. How are you guys doing today? I guess these are the non-camper, non-Memorial Day campers right here. <laughs> well, thank you guys for joining us, and why don't you guys stand as we worship together, um, and just uh, feel free to One, worship God however two, you feel led to. Intro. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come, all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the way they will satisfy. Taste of his goodness. Find what you're looking for. Oh, for God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. Oh, for God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live. From whom all blessings flow, and praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God. From whom all blessings flow, praise Him, praise Him for the wonders. His one and only Son to save. For God so loved the world that He gave us. His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Thank you, Jesus. Dark 
hands drop all over my bones When sorrow comes, steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know Well, I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Fear no longer has a place to of the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind and I won't be shaken I won't be shaken let's sing this together my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Stand in your love. And there is power that can break off every chain. There is power that can empty out a grave. There is resurrection power that can say There's power in your name There's power in your name There is power that can break off every chain There is power that can empty out a grave Oh, there is resurrection power that can say There's power in your name There's power in your name My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. We're standing your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. We stand in your love, no fear anymore. We love you, Jesus. Oh, love you, Lord. Oh, we thank you, Jesus, so much for this time. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for just coming upon us right now, Lord. We feel your presence, Lord, so speak to us, Lord. Yeah. 
Jesus. Hi. How's everybody doing? Well, aren't these guys amazing? Give them, give them some love. Come on now. Hi, I'm Ken Riedel, and I'm one of the community groups leaders here at Journey. And <clears throat> this is an amazing place. So if this is your first time, we want to welcome you. If you're online, enjoy those pajamas and hot cocoa. If you're outside, those are my people out there. We're glad you're out there. And if you're inside, we're really glad to have you here with us this morning. I know, right? So a couple of announcements. Um, the men are going to be having a kickback on 6-4 from 9 to 11 at Farmer Richard's house. So if you don't know Farmer Richard, ask around. Someone will point him out to you. And he's an amazing guy. You'll have a great time. So you want to check that out. Also coming up soon is one of our missionaries from Slovakia, Noah Johnson, is going to be here with us, and he'll be sharing. Yeah, he's an amazing guy. I, I've fallen in love with this guy, and I've fallen in love with Slovakia for all of It's crazy. And then there's a CR code right in front of you on the seat in front of you. If you want to give, this is a great time just to take your phone, click on that, follow the instructions, and give your give your donation, your tithe, or there's boxes in the back, or you can mail it in if you want. But one of the things we just got done talking about last week, I believe, or the week before, was our bringing our, our stewardship. And stewardship isn't just money. It's our, our self, our time, our energy, our love. It's everything about us. And so I want to invite you this morning to be a good steward and follow through with that. Today's Memorial Day, and or tomorrow's Memorial Day, and I just want to acknowledge that. M memorials are interesting. They can be joyous, joyous, joyous ex occasions of, of good memory, and then they can be heartbreaking, too. 
And so our hearts today go out to the people in Texas and the people in, in uh, Ukraine and all over the world that are suffering. And we want to just turn our hearts to them and offer them up because those folks in Texas are never going to have another, another normal Memorial Day. And it's us, God's people, that have the solution to the evil that seems to be coming out more and more in this world these days. And that solution is Jesus living within you. Right? Yeah. All right. I'm glad like four people like that. That was good. <laughs> so we're going to um, invite Jeremy up here in a minute. But would you just stand with me real fast? We're going to pray. We're going to pray that God will speak through Jeremy to all of our hearts. And so, Lord, we ask that today on the day before Memorial Day, that this would be a monumental, momentous day for folks in this room, those people online, and our folks outside. That, Lord, this would be a day that you would meet them right where they're at, and they would recognize that the atomic energy that we think is so amazing is minuscule to the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. God, I pray to you to anoint Jeremy's words this morning as he comes and he shares from his heart. God, may he allow the Spirit of God to rampage through him and out his mouth and speak truth to us and bring hope and healing. And may we be mindful today that today is the day that you've made. And our only responsibility is to rejoice and be glad that we have another day here with our friends and family to love them. Let us love deeply, Father God. Thank you for these folks, and we pray you'd bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. And here is Reverend Keys. John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. This is post Jesus resurrection, post Jesus ascension to heaven, post Pentecost, which uh, represents a party 50 days after Passover. But this last Pentecost, it got a little crazy with the Holy Spirit falling on the place and filling the believers so much so they were speaking in tongues. They were speaking in different languages. The bystanders were freaking out. They're like, what is going on? These guys are drunk. And Peter, he speaks up and he says, we're not drunk yet. It's only 9 a.m. But That was then. Last chapter. When the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, filled the believers and dwelled within them to stay for good. And so, some 50 plus days after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, and probably pretty soon after Pentecost, too, and the coming of the Holy Spirit, Peter and John, the followers of Jesus, went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. So they're still connected to their Jewish roots. As they approach the temple, and think about it, as they walk up toward the steps of the temple, I'm sure they can hear the, the clinking of chisels and the torque of first century cranes and levers, the dust it's gathering in the air because the temple is being renovated. Before them, Nine stories high, stacked high with smooth stones weighing at least a hundred tons. Courtyards, pinnacles, covered porches, the sanctuary, and the Holy of Holies. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth, crippled, unable to walk. He was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. 
And I'm sure he looks out of place here beside the beautiful gate, the largest of the nine gates of the temple complex. It was said to be, maybe it was uh, plated in silver and gold, but m- more, most likely it was an even more exquisite, and even more expensive Corinthian bronze. I mean, it's no surprise that he's begging right here at this location because, well, <laughs> there's the most foot traffic here. But here he is, a man whose feet can't walk, placed beside a gate where everyone walks to do what he can't do, to go in and worship. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. It's not like he can work. And it's not until some time later that Christians actually develop, for the very first time in history, Christians develop a system for caring for the poor beyond a simple simple handout. But here come these two out-of-towners, peasant fishermen, by the look and smell of them. But maybe, maybe they've got something. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, Look at us! The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk! (laughs) Uh Very funny. Heard that one before. Kind of a sick joke, if you ask me. Messed up. Who put you up to this? But Peter's face, it stares intently, hard and resolute. The lines on his young forehead harden. The early onset of crow's feet from his days spent in the sun deepen. His eyes are sharp, his expression determined and full of empathy. Get up and walk. Ah. Yeah, that, that's bold. Like, who, who is this guy? Imagine someone whispers to the crippled man, Psst, it's Peter. He's like, what? I don't know any Peter. Yeah, you know Peter, the one who denied Jesus three times? You know, kind of, uh, you know, thick as a rock, but passionate nonetheless. Jesus did, in fact, call him Satan. Awkward, Right? But, oh, yeah, yeah, and Peter, the one with the temple, the the, the temper, the same guy. (laughs) He lopped off the servant of the high priest, Malchus, chopping off his ear. Same guy, right here and now before you. This Peter is bold. I mean, he was always bold, you could argue, but no, 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 no. Not like this. There's something different about him. Get up and walk. Dang, son, that, that is something else. And it's that something else that we're going to be exploring today as we continue with our sermon series called Elements, and where we're, we're, we're discovering the building blocks of faith. Over the past couple of weeks, we've, we've talked about stewardship and celebration and community and simplicity and Sabbath, and today we're continuing with the indwelling Of the Holy Spirit. And you know, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit inside of believers, it's nothing magical or separate from reality. I think it's actually true reality. Reality and realism at its finest. It's nothing magical that Peter says to the crippled man here at the, at the gate, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. It's no abracadabra, wingardian leviosa. It's the power of the Holy Spirit at work through faith in the name of Jesus and in his authority. Get up in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. Nazarene just refers to his podunk homeland or something. You know, up in northern Israel. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Get up and walk. Four words that Jesus speaks in all four Gospels to those who can't walk. Get up and walk. The Greek verb, agairo. It's what God does to Jesus, raising him from the dead. 
same verb that Jesus is described as using to raise the widow's son and Jairus' dead daughter. Okay, that's great, but, but you're not Jesus, bro. You're Peter. Petras in Greek, meaning a pebble. You're a pebble. Overconfident, impulsive, hot-headed, doubter, denier, finite, limited human being, a lot like a lot of us. But Peter, being filled, freshly filled with the Holy Spirit just last chapter, he calls upon the name and the authority of Jesus through the Holy Spirit's power in all trust and assurance. And it says, then Peter took the lame man by the right hand. Okay, now it gets awkward. Like, yeah, haha, funny with the joke, get up and walk, heard it before, but now you're making it even worse, Peter. <laughs> Just let it go. No, 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 no. Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. Instantly, immediately. He jumped up! Stood on his feet and began to walk. Imagine that, the very first time. He's never walked a step in his life. This is one small step for man. He, he must look like Bambi on ice, barely able to, to wobble his way. But, you know, that's not all. It says, then walking, leaping, and praising God, most likely via the worm or... Um, that floss dance thing. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go ahead and YouTube that. He went into the temple with him. He could have gone anywhere. The beach, Target, Disneyland, wherever. The club. But he goes into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. So it wasn't just with his limbs that he rejoiced, but his shouts of praise were echoing across the walls of the temple courtyard. When they realized this was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. The Greek says they were filled with thambus kai ekstaseos, filled with thambus, wonder, amazement, astonishment. It's used only two other times in the New Testament when Jesus cast out a demon. And when Peter himself is sinking in his boat because Jesus enabled him to catch so many fish, thambus kai ekstaseos. And ekstaseos, that's where we get the word ecstatic, which literally means to be completely removed from. You know those people, right? Completely removed from, but no, completely removed from the ordinary. And I think this is what happens to us and those around us when we are filled with and live by the Holy Spirit. It's amazing, an astonishing break from the ordinary into true reality. This here is clearly something of heaven touching earth doing what no human being could possibly do. The willingness of Peter and John to live by the prompting of the Holy Spirit, it radically changed this crippled man's life and is producing in him and the community around him a healing that is more than calves and quads and gluteus maximuses. It says in verse 11, they all rushed out in amazement. To Solomon's Colonnade, a large plaza on the eastern side of the temple courtyard and complex where there's these massive towering pillars where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. But Peter could have retracted into the background. You know, I'm, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a, a motivational speaker. I mean, sure, he gave his last sermon, his first sermon last chapter in Acts chapter 2. But was it really a sermon, or was it just a response to the people calling him drunk? Well, in verse 12 here, he's moved by something, perhaps something indwelling him to put the words together. And clearing his throat, he begins to speak, People of Israel! What is so surprising about this? 
And why stare at us as though we had made this man walk by our own power or godliness? For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all our ancestors, who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected before Pilate, the Roman governor, the military governor of the area, despite Pilate's decision to release him. You rejected this holy, righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer, a prisoner named Barabbas who had incited a rebellion in which someone was killed. You killed the author of life, literally. But God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this fact. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed, and you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Who is this guy? Who is this guy? Later on, next chapter, we find out he gets arrested for this here second sermon. They brought everybody. They brought the priests and the temple guard and the Sadducees. It wasn't like, oh, let's just get a hold of citizen patrol. You know, the old guys who drive around in the SUVs and they call the police. There's no, like, mall cop going on here. No, no, no. This is a multi-coordinated effort of, like, the LAPD, the FBI, and the CIA to bring Peter down. But not before 2,000 more men are added to the number of believers. Upping it to 5,000 men And ladies, you're like, what? Why are they only counting the men? I don't know I don't know um, But if you ask me If you ask me You cannot lump women together In a faceless numerical figure They are too exceptional too unique, too matchless, too special and rare and extraordinary to lump together. That's all I get? Come on, ladies. Come on. I, I was hoping for like a standing ovation, but that's all right. I mean, we're still getting started. But, you know, if you were to, you know, dare to include women in this faceless numerical figure, the number 5,000 is at least doubled. At least doubled. Thanks to Peter seeing this opportunity to address the crowd with sermon number two. But Peter would say, like he said about the crippled man, You think this is our own power or godliness? No, this is God's doing, so let's give credit where credit is due. <laughs> it's not by my power, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit inside of him that Peter not only heals a crippled man, but he speaks a message in which thousands come to believe, all by and through the Holy Spirit. I remember uh, sitting at a, a table at in and out uh, across from, from me sat a friend visiting. It was maybe like 2007 or 2008, feels like a lifetime ago. And he had traveled some 6,000 miles to sit here with me And he's actually going to travel some 6,000 miles To be here with all of us in two weeks Noah, our missionary church planter in Slovakia He and I spoke about this very story in Acts chapter 3 Way back in 2007, 2008 And what he said about Peter and his ability To heal this crippled man And then speak to the crowds It made me feel a lot better about me you know, so often we carry around with ourselves like a dump truck full of insecurities. Rejection and social anxiety, perfectionism, overthinking it, fear of failure, or thinking that I'm ugly or unattractive or unlovable, or that I'll, I'll die alone. Or that I won't be able to provide for myself or my family. Or the insecurity, how it, it feels like maybe the future just looks really scary. Or how it feels like everyone is always watching me and judging my decisions. 
or if people knew the real me, they, they wouldn't like me. Or I feel at a loss for how to form connections and, and meaningful relationships. I think everyone else is definitely happier than me. At least that's how it looks on Instagram. Or I think everyone's just hanging out without me. Or I, I don't think anyone can relate to what I'm going through. Or I keep my thoughts and my feelings to myself because I figure like no one cares. Or I just feel really freaking alone. And it's heavy. It's heavy to carry the weight of all these insecurities. And our backbones and vertebrae weren't created like the, the chassis of a dump truck. But Noah... Noah talked about how Peter is just like you and me. Peter's not the son of God. He's not born of a virgin. He's not the prince of peace. On most days, he's probably the opposite. He's a fisherman who probably has an extensive vocabulary to go along with it. He's overconfident, impulsive, hot-headed, doubter, denier, finite, limited human being, a lot like a lot of us, a pebble. But then... How in the world does he pull off some stunt like this? Even with all the insecurities, what gave Peter the guts and the grit and the backbone and the nerve to do this? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God inside of him. It's what Noah, our missionary in Slovakia, said to me over animal-style fries. I wonder what our lives would look like if we, regular, ordinary folks, could realize that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. And that's Romans 8, 11. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. You, I mean, that's power, life-shaping, transforming, resurrection-inducing power. And here I am feeling busy, insecure that everyone's definitely happier than me. And so says Instagram. The truth is they probably are because I'm wasting my life just looking at touched-up photos and doggy filters. But really... Really, like, how, how can all of these insecurities that are crippling us, how can these things like rejection and social anxiety and perfectionism, how, how, can, they, how can they even compare to the true reality that the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you? I, mean, I think that reality dispels and casts away all all shortcomings and insecurities. That's what 1 Peter 5, 7 says. Throw all your anxiety onto him because he cares about you. He cares about you. But have you ever wondered, like, if we're just missing it, just missing it. I mean, the God of the universe, the creator of, of nitrogen and pine needles and galaxies and, and E minor, loves us with a radical, unconditional, self sacrificing love. And what's our typical response? We go to church, we sing some songs, and we try not to cuss. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. That's what we do. Uh, cool. Change the world. Radical. Transforming. Whether we verbalized it or not, man, we know, we all know something's wrong. There are problems far beyond our own ability and scope. And everyone keeps saying, like, something needs to change. 
Something needs to change, but no one knows what to do or what to change. And so we keep just saying, something needs to change. Politicians continue to be deeply troubled and deeply saddened and offer thoughts and prayers. And debates rage across all media platforms about how to keep lead from flying into third and fourth graders. Kids who woke up with a Texas sunrise, ate their favorite cereal, tied their shoes in double knots, and laughed with their friends on the bus. We all know something's wrong and something needs to change. Maybe we don't know or, or maybe we don't like what needs to change. But in my small scope and area of influence, I know I can at least just start with me. Because if the God of the universe, the creator of nitrogen and pine needles and galaxies and E minor, loves me with a radical, unconditional, self-sacrificing love, my response needs to be more than then going to church, singing songs, and trying not to cuss. I mean, doesn't something deep inside your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, do doesn't it long to break free from the status quo? Like, like, aren't you hungry for an authentic faith that actually means something and addresses the problems of our world with real, tangible, radical solutions? But what does that look like? Well, God is calling you and I, us, into a passionate love relationship with himself. There is no separation. But the Spirit of God dwells in us, changing us, transforming us, creating us into the people who truly make impacts in our world by friendship, by parenting, by loving and learning and serving, by politics and business, ministry, teaching, missions, healthcare, whatever. Because I think the answer to the complacency and the apathy that is absolutely decimating the church and her mission in the world, it isn't working harder at a list of do's and don'ts. It's falling in love with God and living by the Spirit dwelling inside of us. And once we encounter that, oh, I'll stop for claps. I will stop for claps. But don't think for a moment, what was it that Peter said? Uh, you think this was by our own strength or ability? No, it's by him and the truth of his word. But I think when we encounter his love and experience his way and his truth in his life, we will never be the same. It changes everything. Like Peter changed the world. It changed Peter to change the world. The Holy Spirit did to speak, to heal, to do God's work. It changed the lives of 5,000 men, and let's at least double it by including the women. It changed the life of a crippled man who thought his days depended on silver and gold. But when we look at this story, whose sandals are you in? Peter or John, those living by the power and indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the prompting? Or are we the crippled man, crippled by the insecurities and unable to walk? We try to step day by day on crippled legs instead of by the Holy Spirit. So let's just get down to the brass tacks, the nitty-gritty, the basic elements. What is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Well, it's when God makes his home in your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, everything that makes you, you. It's like, yeah, I know you've got a dump truck full of insecurities. Let's just move it down the street, or better yet, take it out to the desert, light it on fire, because God is moving U-Haul after U-Haul after U-Haul after U-Haul of himself into your life. Because when someone accepts Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit gives them the life of God, eternal life, and the Holy Spirit comes to live within them. So if you believe in Jesus and the Holy Spirit dwells in you, shouldn't there be a huge, massive, tremendous, gigantic difference between the person who has the Spirit of God living in them and the person who doesn't? World of a difference. World of a difference. Well, what does it do? Well, here are, are, 
here are a few of the countless innumerable things that the Holy Spirit does. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit, it comes to a soul. In Hebrew, it's nefesh. In Greek, it's suke. It means something like soul, life, self, being. It comes to a soul, self, life, being that is dead in sin, and it creates new life. The Holy Spirit com confirms that we belong to Jesus, and we are a part of his universal all time, all space, church. The Holy Spirit gives spiritual gifts, God-given abilities to build up the church, to change the world and serve Jesus effectively for His glory. So just consider for a moment, if everyone gave financially, and I'm not afraid to talk about money, if everyone gave financially and served and prayed and used their God-given abilities exactly like you, would the church be healthy and empowered or weak and apathetic? The Holy Spirit helps us to understand and apply the scriptures to our daily lives to use those spiritual gifts, the God-given abilities. The Holy Spirit empowers us if we're ready and willing to live for Jesus. And I love that. Like, it's, it's interesting that it's not able and qualified or well-equipped, but ready and willing. The Holy Spirit leads us in paths of right living. The Holy Spirit produces in us the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and don't forget about self-control. The Holy Spirit is grieved when we sin and convicts us to confess our sin to God, to ask for forgiveness and restoration. And this is my favorite. The Holy Spirit seals or guarantees our heavenly homeland when this short life is through. This list is endless, though. The Holy Spirit is comforter, concealer, helper, healer, advocate, truth, wisdom, grace, prophecy, revelation, power of the highest, breath of the Almighty. So then how do we live by it? How do we live by the Holy Spirit? Well, it's all by the ability of the Spirit. It's not a human effort. It's not pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. I think it's a lot more like surrender and listening and obedience. You're definitely going to go somewhere and do some stuff that you normally wouldn't do in places you normally wouldn't go. It's rarely safe or pretty or comfortable, but it's always good and loving and right because the Spirit will mold you into the person you were always created to be. And you may think that's the thing with surrender and submission to God. It's like, well, I'm giving up all of this. I'm giving up everything. I'm surrendering it all before you. But it, at the outset, it feels like you're giving it all up. And in reality, you are. Because Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. Die to yourself and follow me. But in doing that, we receive new life, and we become more ourselves than we ever could have imagined. We become more real and more who God has created us to be. But I think we have such a knack for masking this process or just avoiding it entirely. And avoiding this process of the Holy Spirit working in our lives on a daily basis, an hourly, minute-by-minute, second basis, I think we avoid it, and we do so in such a Christian way, too. Something as Christian is God's will for my life. God's will for my life. I think a lot of us just need to forget about God's will for my life. Because God cares more about your response to the Spirit's leading today in this moment than about what you intend to do next year. Huh. I mean, in fact, the decisions that you make today by the prompting of the Holy Spirit will dramatically affect the decisions you intend to make next year. I think it's easy to use God's will for my life as an excuse for inaction or disobedience. It's much less demanding to think about God's will for my life than it is to ask Him, God, what should I do in the next 10 minutes? It's safer to commit to following him someday instead of this day.
So first step, accept Jesus as Lord of your life. Invite him in to be Lord and master over every bone in your body, every cell and fiber of your being, every hope and dream and aspiration. And then with the Holy Spirit poured into your heart and enlivening your bones, everything is entirely new. Like in the book of Ezekiel. When God speaks to the prophet, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. I love that. Tender and responsive. Like Peter with the crippled man or speaking before the crowd the words the Spirit gave him and I will put my Spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. So then, well, what's so important about it? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What's so important about it? Well, there is no Christian life without the Holy Spirit. There is no Christian life without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the essential element of a true Christian community and of Jesus' followers. Christianity, in other words, is impossible without the Holy Spirit. Impossible. For us to be truly Christian, and not just Christian in name, the Holy Spirit must affect us and our community. And when that happens, we reflect God. What a privilege. We reflect God. Whether it's beside a beautiful gate with the ongoing chisels where a crippled man sits in expectation, or whether it's in the 805 where conversations at in and out can embolden us to live by the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit affects us and our community, we reflect God. Even with our dump trucks full of insecurities, the God of the universe, the creator of nitrogen and pine needles and galaxies and E minor, loves us with a radical, unconditional, self-sacrificing love. This God is eager to burst into our lives, to produce change in us and in our communities. And our response must be far greater than simply going to church and singing songs and trying not to cuss. I do really wonder what would our lives look like if we, regular, ordinary folks, could realize that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. It's nothing magical. It's nothing separate from reality. I think it's true reality. I think it's realism at its finest. The Holy Spirit inside of us transforming overconfident, impulsive, hot-headed, doubting, denying, finite, limited human beings into world changers. Because let's face it, the world is not truly moved by actions of love or human creation. It's not moved by simple human acts of love of human creation. The world is truly moved by the Holy Spirit in our lives. Without the Holy Spirit, the church just looks like a social club. But when we live by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's supernatural. Supernatural. And we cannot help but be different, and the world cannot help but notice. So let's pray. Let's pray that God would empower us. Let's pray that God would empower us so radically that we get zero glory. Let's pray that God would empower us so radically that we get zero glory. But that people would see the work of the Holy Spirit in us and praise God. After all, you cannot lift up Jesus and yourself at the same time. It's something I tell myself every time before I come on stage. You cannot lift up yourself and Jesus at the same time. But you know what? I got really good at lifting up myself after I got off stage. Really good. 
five or six years ago. It was a Sunday right after Christmas. And I mean, I gave the message that day and I just killed it. I, I blew people away. The Spirit of God, the fire was just raging. People were slain in the Spirit. Like Jesus came back just to hear real quick. And I mean, lives were transformed and shaped. People falling all over the place. It was astounding. Most amazing message people have ever heard. So amazing. I don't even remember what it was about. But it was incredible. Incredible. And there's nothing like having to tear down the church after you deliver such a life-changing, transforming message to humble you. We're cleaning down, or tearing down the church and cleaning up, and there in the back of, of the room stands 92, 93-year-old with her walker, Grandma Mac. Standing in the back of the room, I'm thinking, all right, well, she's, she's probably going to go, like, treat me to lunch because, you know— I just like blew her away. You know, we're going to go to Chester's Chinese or her favorite burger barn. It just blew her away. I mean, in her 92, 93 years, she'd probably never heard anything so profound as my message. I'm like, all right, where are we going? She's like, hmm, we're going to go put into practice what you just preached about. I'm like, nah, I didn't really want to do that. You know, it's not really my thing, you know. She said, no, 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 we're, we're going to go do what you talked about. You talk about, like, changing the world or being an influence, people's lives, whatever. Let's go do that. We're going to go to visit an old friend of mine. And she's, she's, my, she's my wife's grandmother. And so I was like, well, listen, lady. You can talk like that to someone who's not your grandma. Listen, lady. It's Sunday afternoon. There's a north-northwest swell coming through. There's Sunday football on. I've got things to do. But the Holy Spirit was speaking to her, telling her that Tara and I should go with her to visit her old friend. And so I went kicking and screaming because something inside of me was saying, yeah, you should probably go too. And so we drove all the way to Oxnard. <laughs> all the way to Oxnard, but like deep Oxnard, real deep Oxnard. It took like 15 minutes, you know. Drove all the way to Oxnard. I'm like, I don't know this lady. I don't know what we're going to do. We pull up to this rundown apartment complex. And I, I get out. I'm dragging my feet. And I, I, I'm like, I don't know what am I, what am I supposed to do. I, I take the Bible because I'm a pastor. That's what you're supposed to do. So I'm dragging my feet all the way. Grandma Max her, got her walker scraping along the concrete pathway. And we finally get to the door. My knuckles wrap on this flimsy screen door. And I hear this old croaky voice from inside saying, <clears throat> come on in. I walk into the room. There's this lady I'd never seen before. I don't even know her name. She's sitting on a recliner. And she's got a, a stack of blankets on and on top of the blankets, there's a, a box of tissues. Turns out her son just died. Yesterday. On Christmas Day. And I don't remember all that we said or that we did that Sunday afternoon, but we were there a long time but we were world changers, at least for her world. All because Grandma Mac listened to the Holy Spirit inside of her. We got to reflect God. So God, I pray that we would be world changers today, right here in this moment, here and now, and moving forward, that we could live our lives in full trust and assurance who you are and what you have done and that it makes a difference. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that lives in us. And I pray, God, that we would be bold with that. And I don't mean just, just back-talking people on Facebook. I don't just mean coming to church and singing songs and, and trying not to cuss, but I, I mean really living by the spirit. Stopping things like human trafficking. Taking a part and raising a family. 
We're listening to friends. We're surrendering it all. We're obeying whatever you tell us to do because it's crazy. But we want to be willing and ready to be used by you for your glory alone. So Jesus, I pray if someone wants to experience you for the first time, that they believe that you died on the cross for them, just like the people who listened to Peter, that they would believe in their hearts that Jesus, you died on the cross for them, but you rose from the grave because death couldn't handle you. So I pray that you come into their lives. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Fill them, Lord. That it would be inescapable. That we would cry out the words of the psalmist, where can I go from your spirit? Because I can't go anywhere. You're here, you're now. And I need you more than ever to live the life that you've called me to live. And so Jesus, we want to be ready and we want to be willing. So fill us, we pray. I want to just close with this Psalm 139. It says, O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such Knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. And maybe that's what you need today. Praise God. With weapons unseen, enemies crash to their knees as we rise up in worship. Verse two. When trials unleash like a flood, the battle belongs to us. As we cry out in worship. The victory is yours. You're riding on the storm. Your name is unfailing. Though kingdoms rise and fall, your throne withstands them. Your name is unshaken. What hell meant to break me has failed. Now nothing can die my praise. I will cry out in worship. Keep, 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 keep,
Another wonderful sermon by Jeremy. Just remain standing for a minute. Yeah, give it up. Sometimes God asks us to step outside of ourselves and do things that are uncomfortable. And I kind of feel on my heart that he's going to ask you to do that here in a second. And so today, as we just stand here, and we just take a quiet moment and we contemplate this wonder-working God, this powerful God that can take an ordinary knucklehead like me and take my life and turn me into a life change agent. Because really, honestly, that's what my life's all about for other people. And he can do the same thing for you. And so this morning, if what Jeremy shared for, to you and the Holy Spirit recognized it and there was a little stirring inside your heart like, yeah, this is what I need to hear. Sometimes we need to make a proclamation, like make a decision and be firm about it. And what better time to make a decision about releasing the power of the Holy Spirit in our own lives and listening to that still small voice and then doing what it says than the day of Memorial Day. So if you were touched this morning, I'm not going to embarrass anybody. But if you heard something that touched you, comforted you, changed you, stirred you, just pop up your hand. Is there anybody like that? Because it did me. It brought me to tears. So let me pray for you right now. Father God, I just pray that you would loose the power of the Holy Spirit in all of our lives. For Lord, we are the answer through the power of the Holy Spirit to change this world for your kingdom. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Is a very dangerous thing to pray in faith because, God, you're always faithful to send us where we need to be, whether it's to a deep Osnard visitation or a phone call from a friend that talks about their son just OD'd from fentanyl or to our son as our daughter is graduating high school or college. God, we're all in those places at the same time. You don't see us as our broken self. You see us in our complete self through your grace, in our beauty. You see us as we will be, not as we are. And may we rest in the grace of God and loose the Holy Spirit into this church, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, sign up for uh, the men's gathering. Go outside, buy some merch. And most of all, reach out and touch somebody today. Give them some love. Have a great morning, guys.